Good afternoon and welcome to the 160th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today we have a discussion of COVID-19 and the Postal Service with Ryan Ellis and Richard Chan. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. And please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, October 30th, 2020, there are 1,183,400 deaths from COVID-19 globally. According to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center, there are 8,955,035 cases in the United States. That's up from 8,873,861 cases yesterday. There are now a total of 228,808 deaths in the United States from COVID-19 from 227,968 yesterday, another day approaching right at that 1,000 deaths a day mark. As a way to bring humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is Sunny Quitlong grocery store and post office employee who saw the best in everyone dies of coronavirus. This appeared in the Seattle Times, May 27th by David Gutman. Thanksgivings at Sonny Quitlong's house were the stuff of legend. There was rarely a sit down meal. Instead, he'd set up the buffet line around noon and people would come and go throughout the day and late into the night. There was, of course, turkey stuffing and the standbys. There was also lechon, a whole roast pig, Pancit, adobo, lumpia, and other Filipino fixtures. Upward of 100 people would trickle in and out of the South Seattle home Mr. Quitlong shared with his wife, Sineda. Roughly half the guests would be from his large extended family, but there were also friends and coworkers who he knew didn't have anywhere else to go. They invited and welcomed them to their home, said his sister, Queenie Quitlong Braun. The food was endless, it was an eating marathon. Mr. Quitlong died on April 6th of COVID-19, he was 70. For decades, Mr. Quitlong worked as a checker at a Safeway on Rainier Avenue and as a, as a mail handler at the US Postal Service Distribution Center in Tukwila. Even after he was hired full-time at the post office, he kept working a few days a month at the grocery store because he liked seeing and talking to customers, family members said. Everyone knew Sonny, his union at the grocery store United Food and Commercial Workers 21 wrote after his death, customers went out of their way to get in his line or just to come up and say hi if he wasn't the one ringing them up. He was one of the most generous people, Quitlong Braun said. When things were needed, he was just one of the first to help out. At least 60 postal employees had died of COVID-19 as of the time this obituary was published in late May, according to the National Postal Mail Handlers Union, and at least 100 grocery store workers across the country had died of COVID-19 at that time, according to the Washington Post. Mr. Quitlong was among the first. Carrie Ben Sonny Dizon Quitlong was born August 14, 1949, in the Pandacan district of Manila, Philippines. He attended the University of Santo Tomas in Manila, where he studied electrical engineering and graduated in an ROTC program. After college, he was commissioned in the Philippine Army where he served as a communications officer in the Southern Philippines, installing and maintaining communication lines in the region. He left the Army as a first lieutenant. In 1978, Mr. Quitlong's parents immigrated to the United States, settling in Seattle. Two years later, Mr. Quitlong and his two siblings joined them. I think they still believed that America was the land of opportunity and thankfully they were able to achieve that through hard work. Quitlong Braun said. Mr. Quitlong returned briefly to the Philippines in 1981 to marry Zaneda Nieri, whom he had met in graduate school. The couple returned to Seattle, where Mr. Quitlong found work as a desk clerk at the Bush Hotel in Chinatown in the International District before moving to Safeway in 1989. 
He joined the post office in 1994. He held both jobs full time at the post office, part time at Safeway until his death. If he was on break and I was in the break room, he'd offer me some of his lunch, said Monica Bryant, a former co-worker at Safeway. He was genuine like that. I'm sure I wasn't the only one he looked out for. Mr. Quitlong had a near photographic memory, his sister said. He remembered the serial numbers of the men in his army company. He remembered the children and the birthdays of his customers at Safeway. Local Facebook pages were flooded with remembrances upon learning of his death. I always sought Sonny out when it came time to check out at Safeway, one woman wrote. He was so friendly and kind, I remember him making a big deal of any donation anyone made to the charity of the month. His way of serving really stood out at Safeway, wrote another. Going through his line guaranteed a pleasant moment in my day, no matter how busy things were. Mr. Quitlong was a lector at St. Mary's Church, where he and his wife were active members. He was a sharp dresser, frequently sporting a barong tagalog, the formal Filipino menswear. Friends called him Senator. He loved karaoke, especially Tony Bennett's I Left My Heart in San Francisco, and family gatherings usually ended in singing and dancing. His sister remembers how he would tell jokes and always end up laughing before he got to the punchline. In our world, sometimes people tend to be judgmental, she said. He was never that. He always saw the best in everyone. Okay, I'm gonna to turn to our discussion for today and I'm really excited to introduce my guests, real experts in this area of our discussion today. Let me introduce Ryan Ellis. First, Ryan is Assistant Professor of Communication Studies at Northeastern University. Ryan's research and teaching focuses on topics related to communication law and policy, infrastructure politics, and cybersecurity. He's the author of Letters, Power Lines, and Other Dangerous Things, The Politics of Infrastructure Security, which appeared with MIT Press this year, and the editor with Vivek Mohan of Rewired, Cybersecurity Governance, which appeared with Wiley in 2019. Richard R. John is a historian who specializes in the history of business, technology, communications, and American political development. He teaches and advises graduate students in Columbia University's PhD program in communications, and is a member of the core faculty of the Columbia History Department, where he teaches courses on the history of capitalism and the history of communications. His publications include many essays, eight edited books, and two monographs, Spreading the News, the American Postal System from Franklin to Morse, which appeared in 1995, and Network Nation, Inventing American Telecommunications. Richard and Ryan, thank you so much for making time to join me on COVID Calls today. Happy to be here. Thanks, Scott. So I'm gonna start the way I usually do and just to find out where you're calling from and how the pandemic is looking there. Ryan, I'm gonna start with you. I wanna thank you for being a two-time COVID Calls guest and you appeared on May 18th uh, and on that day with Megan Finn, and on that day, mm -hmm. there were 90,312 deaths. I went back and, and looked at that. So how are you and how are things there where you are? Uh, thanks, Scott. I'm okay. I am hiding out in my basement like many of us. I have changed basement rooms since we last spoke. I went from room A to room B. Um, so that's the kind of excitement we have here in Waltham, Massachusetts. Not much going on. Um, we're doing okay. The COVID cases are spiking in our community and they have been as they have been across the country the last four or five weeks. Um, so things have eased back a little bit in terms of, um, you know, the restrictions are ramping up again here as they are lots of places. Personally, doing okay, hanging in and happy to be back. Thanks for that. And, and thanks for, now we've seen both of the rooms in your basement. This, yes. is, this is it. If you're gonna come back a third room. time, you have to finish out a third room. Richard, um, turning to you, um, finding out where you're calling from and, and how the pandemic looks there today. I'm calling from Morningside Heights in uh, Manhattan. Uh, pandemic, I voted uh, on Wednesday. Uh, the uh, voting uh, situation was well organized, uh, but there is concern. Numbers are up here as they are up in Massachusetts. Uh, we are observing social distancing at Columbia University. Uh, we have had not a spike, had not had a spike on campus, but we are quite concerned, especially about right now the outer boroughs. Richard, how many of your students are on campus? Is it only the grad students or undergraduates there as well? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, my graduate, I teach a hybrid graduate student course, which I have 
uh, five students who attend and the 11 are uh, remote. They're down the end of the table on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Undergraduates, we are required to teach uh, distance, but about half of my class, if not more, is living near campus. And to accommodate them, I meet in a socially distanced fashion on Saturday mornings under a tent near Hamilton Hall on campus. So Kidding. we meet out of doors, but uh, you know they're all ostensibly at a distance. That's uh, at least three different modes of teaching and interaction that you're managing simultaneously right now. Right. Amazing. Well. Thank you both for making time to talk about the Postal Service and the and the pandemic. And of course, with the election just around the corner, we're going to layer that in too. I guess I want to just start by making sure that we've got some of the facts straight. We've heard a lot of the reporting over the year about the Postal Service, and particularly since the new Postmaster General started in May. Richard, let me just start with you, and then Ryan, I'll bring you in. How is the Postal Service doing this year compared to previous years? And what about this idea that some have said that the new postmaster has damaged the capacity of the Postal Service. Right, well, that's a great question. And I think there's two ways to answer it. One, some of the changes that we are now so concerned about, the elimination of the sorting machinery and the elimination of, of the blue mailboxes were called for before Louis DeJoy came. So that's not his doing, but, uh, the percentages, on time percentages for first class mail, especially in battleground states, as reported recently in the Washington Post, are way down. And they're especially far down in Philadelphia. Should be 90%. That's what the Postal Service has maintained uh, over a long period of time. And that's been dropping. DeJoy has cut over time. He has tried to uh, oblige postal workers to follow a more rigid a schedule for delivering the mail, and this has caused uh, the numbers to plummet and is a source of concern. And in fact, uh, he's, the post office is being daily monitored by a, a Washington, D.C. district court judge to try to keep those percentages up. So we are past the time when it is safe to put your ballot into the mail uh, at a blue mailbox. If you must vote by mail, you should take your ballot to the uh, post office uh, itself. You should not trust the blue mailboxes. We cannot rely, unfortunately, on the post office to do its job. And uh, DeJoy is uh, in part responsible for that, despite his protestations to the contrary. I'm very disappointed. Uh, he had the logistics background. He's an intelligent guy, but he is uh, on his way to uh, entering the uh, annals of infamy as postal administrators. I'm glad you got that. Thank you for that. And also that public service announcement about what to do with your mail-in ballot at this point. Don't mail it. Ryan, just to bring you in on this sort of context setting, uh, what might you add to what, what Richard said? Some of the changes already underway, but then other things that have emerged since DeJoy has been postmaster, which hasn't been that long, which we're really seeing the implications of now. That's right. He hasn't really been postmaster general that long. And as Richard pointed out, some of the things, the most visible things that became flashpoints over the summer, the removal of the mailboxes, the decommissioning of sorting machines, they certainly accelerated over the summer under DeJoy. But I think one of the key things, and Richard mentioned this briefly, that is leading to the sort of slowdown in service and the anxiety around service, certainly at the release of the election, is the cutting of overtime. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for decades, the Postal Service has been trying to keep down the number of employees. It's been a cost reduction strategy for a long time. And what that means is very often regular carriers, your regular letter carrier or temporary carriers are there to pick up the slack by adding, adding hours. Mm -hmm. What Joy has done is slash the ability for workers to work overtime, which has really impacted performance. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the recent um, Inspector General report that was sought by congressional leaders makes this point plain. And as Richard said, this is a smart person who has a logistics background. And to read that a lot of these operational changes aren't even being documented, they're only being communicated orally to the sort of field, it couldn't help but lead to the confusion and the operational challenges we're now seeing. So I think DeJoy has to own that, certainly, right? Mm -hmm. I guess I may just want to follow up on this for either one of you or both. I 
am surprised that you would be able to see such profound changes so quickly. And maybe I'm surprising myself that I still have so much trust in the so-called deep state and bureaucracy that somebody could come in in May and, and slow down the mail that much. But you're both telling me in different ways that complement each other that that's exactly what's happening. 60%. Uh, on-time delivery for the battleground states is really poor. And in Philadelphia, it's down to 43%, according Absolutely. to the Washington Post. Those are not the kind of numbers that you want to be, uh, you know, you, that's not where you want to be at one week before the election. And DeJoy has claimed that he's, he's not making any of the uh, major changes until after the election, but something is going on in the organization that is impeding the ability of our 600 and some thousand postal workers to get the job done. And this is a cause for uh, concern. You know, it's it's hard to know. You're right, this is a huge organization. Um, a lot of ballots have been mailed. They've not all been returned. Who knows why that is? It may be that the voters want to vote in person. But those kind of numbers are a real public relations disaster. And, and they are going to raise questions about the legitimacy of the election if the ballots are not counted that come in, say, the day of or even the day after. It seems to me it's incumbent on the courts to recognize that operational mm -hmm. reality. Ryan, is there nothing Congress could have done before now to intervene in this? Well, there, there's lots of things Congress could have done to intervene. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of oversight, no, there's there's many, many things they could have done. Now, I don't think there's things necessarily they might be able to be done now as we're a handful of days at most yeah. before the election. But I think one thing to stress here, Scott, is the post office and the postal network is enormous, as you mentioned, right? 600,000 employees, billions of pieces of mail. Mm -hmm. But there's a few core points that if you make changes there, there's only you know 200 odd distribution facilities. So changes there can impact the network in significant ways, certainly in battleground mm -hmm. states, as Richard pointed out. Additionally, large urban post offices mm -hmm. Changes there in terms of staffing, and as we mentioned, overtime, they can have a disproportionate impact on service level. So even though it's a huge operation, and we think of it rightly as this huge distributed network, there are points of it that are really dense, and changes there can really matter. Uh -huh. So right. let, let me, um, uh, Richard, you literally wrote the book on the post office. So I'm so glad you're here today uh, and to talk about this. And I, I'm going to give out this quote just because I feel like I have to. It's the unofficial motto, uh, as Richard has told me, of the post office. Neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. Fair enough. And um, this seems to be one of those, uh, I don't see pandemic in that unofficial motto, but it seems to be in, entailed in that. Have we ever seen or can you tell us a bit about episodes historically where the Postal Service has faced significant disruption because of pandemic, war, disaster? Let me bring us a little bit on the context of that. Yeah, that's a good question. We had, of course, the pandemic of 1918-19. Uh, you had yellow fever uh, pandemic in the 1790s. Uh, neither of those uh, two events has, has left a, uh, a strong trace in our understanding of the history of uh, the post office. The biggest crises, uh, and I'm sure Scott can provide additional insight, uh, with the 19, it was the 1966 strike in Chicago, uh, and then, or it was actually just a collapse of the delivery of the mail. It was the 66 in Chicago, and then the Wildcat strike in 1970. Those were the two events. And the Wildcat strike was quite interesting, because it was not ca called by the unions, it's Wildcat, and Nixon's response was really very, very sympathetic toward the postal workers. He wanted uh, postal workers to get back to work. He wanted the mail to be delivered. This is enormously important. He did not attack, and I, I, I could use the vulgar term trash, the organization as the current uh, president has. And those were, the, I, those were the two that would come to mind. Uh, Scott, you might have uh, more insight into this, but the yellow fever epidemic and the pandemic, so-called Spanish flu, uh, were not as uh, consequential as uh, those two events, in my opinion. Ryan, I'll bring you in on that. 
Yeah, I think Richard's, you're gonna hear me say throughout our conversation, I think Richard has it right. Cause of course Richard has it right when it comes to the post office, how could he not? <laughs> the Chicago breakdown is real interesting cause it's not a natural disaster. It wasn't an earthquake, right? It was years of sort of legacy mismanagement building up essentially. And what you had happening is you had tractor trailers filled with mail lining the streets of Chicago that simply couldn't be processed. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was discussed, and this seems to happen occasionally when things go bad or things go south at the post office, they discuss burning the mail, right? To restart the system. Let's burn the backlog of mail. This was a significant failure. <laughs> but something good did come out of it. Um, that incident, along with later the Wildcat strike in 1970, was used as the impetus to both first push forward a detailed study of the old post office department, as it was then called, and later led to Congress creating the United States Postal Service. That's what came out of it. And so that is one thing that, you know, it's not a natural disaster. It's very much a man-made disaster, but that left a significant legacy on the postal system in this country. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting because what you're both telling me is that um, through quite significant um, disruptions that we might call through disaster periods, the Postal Service and, and postal delivery fared just fine. It was more because of management, mismanagement, labor issues in, in those kinds of in those kinds of times. And it might not be what people would necessarily be expecting. Remarkable workforce. You have a well-established set of protocols. Uh, the basic tasks are well-defined. It's one of the jewels of civilization. I think even in this current moment, we see postal workers going to enormous lengths to deliver the mail, right? They care mm -hmm. about the service in a way that I wish our leaders also would recognize and adopt. Mm -hmm. Very well put. Well, l Ryan, let me stay with you for a second. When I had you um, on in May, we talked about, um, it's an interesting to bring those two conversations side by side is quite interesting because at that time we were talking about what we thought were the implications of the pandemic for postal workers as essential workers. That is to say, um, not just taking on more work, but also taking on more dangerous work. And there were significant uncertainties at that time uh, still about how COVID was transmitted. So there was a lot of people were still spraying their mail down with right. bleach or putting it outside for a week or whatever. I, I want you to reflect a little bit, maybe if you could, about sort of what we thought then versus now and how the situation of postal workers has changed between now and then. Yeah, that's a great question. So I remember back then, I, like most of us, was yeah, scrubbing down mail or leaving it out to you know air out for a couple of days. And those are, as we see like historically, those are very common reactions to what happens during pandemics in the mail. People fumigated mail, right. they have developed elaborate methods of disinfecting the mail. So it makes sense during a pandemic, people have anxiety about things coming in their home. But the situation certainly has changed. I think we know now a bit better, and this is certainly not my area of expertise, uh, my social scientist, of course, but it appears that the method of transmission that we really should be worried about is aerosolization, right? So being in close quarters, speaking around people, this is what we worry about much more than it being passed like fomites on surfaces. So that's certainly, at least in my personal experience, has been a big change. Now, when it comes to the essential workers, you know, there was a period where people were really going out of their way to make a point of thanking doctors and nurses and even letter carriers and delivery folks. As this has gone on, I've seen somewhat less of that, you know, as people are getting fatigued to a degree, but it's important to remember the folks who are delivering your mail today were the same people that were probably doing it back in May. And many of them, I can't help but imagine, are probably exhausted. This is a very different, difficult working time for everybody, whether they be a professor or, you know, someone delivering your mail. And so, keeping the focus on the difficulties of that job and how hard it is. And it remains just like it was back in May and just like it will be someday when this pandemic hopefully is over. It's essential work and they are essential workers. And so I have an enormous amount of sympathy and I worry about the fatigue and the burnout rates. That's one of my sort of concerns now that I don't think we had in May where it was more of an acute crisis. Mm -hmm. for the Richard, is that something that you can, first of all, just your reaction to that, but also sort of thinking historically about times in which maybe the Postal Service workforce was not big enough and there was sort of a lot of strain on the workforce or, you know, sort of understanding a little bit what kind of protections um, they've had historically to keep themselves physically in shape to do this kind of work? 
Well, the, the 2001 uh, anthrax, anthrax attack comes to mind. Two postal right. workers were killed in that uh, attack. Uh, in the 1830s, uh, there was a uh, kind of a, a crazed, uh, uh, angry man who sent live smallpox uh, through the mail in, in order to uh, pay back uh, some somebody he was uh, angry with. Um, and of course, dangerous substances are sent through the mail uh, regularly, um, not supposed to, but that happens. But those are the two that come to mind, 1830s and uh, 2001. I mean, the, the post office understaffed, overstaffed. Um, th this has been a perennial question throughout the history of the uh, organization. But there's been remarkable improvements, and Ryan can probably speak to this much better than I can, uh, since... 1970, half of all the world's mail goes through the United States Postal Service, delivering every single ballot in the country. Say, if every single American voted, it's not that big a deal for the Postal Service if everything is running as it should. So the, the situation we're encountering today is really quite unusual. And of course, one reason that we're concerned, this is kind of the elephant in the room, is that the president has openly disparaged the post office. He has openly said that if everybody votes who can vote, no Republican will ever be elected again. Uh, and he has called into question the efficacy of mail-in voting in certain states, but not others. So we, we have a, a situation where the integrity of the institution is being attacked by the president of the United States in a way that in my experience, I've tried to think of other examples, is unprecedented. Uh, Nixon didn't do that in 1970. Um, Eisenhower didn't do that during postal strike in 1950s. Even Andrew Jackson, who, who, who established the spoils system and undermined the integrity of the kind of career mm. civil service such as it existed at the time, uh, and made kind of wild statements about abolitionist males, did not impugn the day-to-day -day operational uh, integrity of the organization as the current president has. And, and that's, a, that's very strange. And, and it's something I find really as a citizen pretty offensive. And I, uh, it makes me more and more admiring of the over 600,000 men and women who are out there every day delivering our mail, because it is, after all, a fundamental pillar of our constitutional form of government. It's not surprising that the post office is at the center of the election uh, because it is that important to our uh, collective existence and has been since the 1790s, if not even longer. Well, that's uh, that's the exact segue that I wanted to make in, into sort of talking about the the pandemic and leading into, you know, the, the election. Ryan, first of all, just sort of get your reaction to what Richard has said there. And then let's just talk a little bit about mail-in voting and the history of mail-in voting, because it is, I mean, as Richard said, I mean, it's hard to characterize Trump's motives, but it's like voting, the, it's like criticizing the voting machines for how people vote or something. It's not, it, you know, why would you go after the, the system? In this sense, the postal system, why would you go after that instead of actually engaging um, with something he might have a concern about, which is individual states allowing mail-in voting? Maybe we could talk about that, but that's not a discussion about the postal service. Ryan, I don't no. know, what do you think? Well, I think, yeah, it's hard to guess an individual's motives, but plainly an attack on a democratic institution and it shows like a discomfort with an institution that has been a pillar of our democracy for well over two centuries now and so thinking about why that is is hard it's hard to guess and sort of put your finger on the motives but i think we could all share a revulsion at it right the idea here that making it accessible and easy to vote is something to shy away from uh, attacks on the integrity of the service itself. These are things that are attacks on American institutions, right? So from a sense of patriotic duty and inspiration, I find it also sort of deeply concerning and offensive. I can't quite guess the motives, but I can see the outcome and it's fairly distasteful. I think Richard drew a good parallel here. Um, Nixon in the 70s during the strike, even Nixon here, he took it as an opportunity to find common cause and to really push forward a set of reforms that were in the works or stalled. Here we see something different. It's more just a sort of broadside attack against the men and women who deliver the mail 
and the sort of cornerstone jewel of American democracy, as Richard put it earlier, right? So it is deeply concerning, even if the practical impact on the election winds up being negligible, which I don't think is a foregone conclusion by any means. And even if it is, right, let's hope that's happened. Let's hope that it doesn't impact the outcome of the election one way or another. It still is deeply alarming to see the president of the United States attack this institution. Mm -hmm. Just a reminder, you're listening to COVID calls, and today we're talking about the Postal Service and the election and the pandemic with Richard, John, and Ryan Ellis. Richard, let me get some more perspective from you on this. When did mail-in voting in the United States get started? The Civil War. Uh, soldiers voted in large numbers. In 1864, it was said uh, that Lincoln wanted to encourage voters, uh, to uh, soldiers to vote uh, out of a sense of Civic, civic obligation. Uh, it, he, it was not clear that the voters were going to vote for Lincoln. Uh, so that was a courageous move on his part. He wasn't trying to game the system. And military uh, personnel has voted uh, by mail overseas uh, since that time. In fact, there's an entire office of the Pentagon that's dedicated to facilitating mail-in voting of our servicemen and women as is entirely appropriate. Um, in, in Oregon, a number of other states, we've had uh, mail-in voting for decades. I think almost all voting, I was trying to get the percentages in Oregon uh, has been mail-in. I think Utah is another state, a uh, couple other states um, out West. So this is a, it's a become an American tradition independent of the pandemic. But of course, with the pandemic, the, 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 the you know the rationale for it is all the more right. uh, apparent, but it's not. It's not something new, um, and and that I think is is worth underscoring. So so you're you are. It's like attacking voting itself, which um, it has recently become an issue, at least in the the news accounts. You know, that certain Americans just shouldn't vote. Well, we've been down that road. Yeah, and sure. The consensus is is that that wasn't a good idea. Um, that that's fundamentally corrosive to our civic fabric, that all adults who meet certain criteria should be uh, able to vote, period. And we should encourage those Americans to vote. Voting itself is an act of civic engagement. Uh, and that should be encouraged because civic engagement is what helps to sustain our remarkable experiment in self-government. It It's kind of odd to have to be stating these very basic things about our governments, like giving a tutorial into what our founders believed. Mm -hmm. But it seems that we are put in this position, not only by the president, but also astonishingly by at least one member of the Supreme Court, who, who's made these incredible statements about uh, tipping the election if we count the votes after election day. That's not tipping the election. That's counting the ballots. That's what you're supposed to do. Um, so we're in a very odd position, particularly if, if you're a jurist and you have respect for original intent. The founders would have wanted the votes counted. and The founders wouldn't have sanctioned this kind of uh, interference of the judiciary with procedures that should be it should be conducted at the level of the states and the state um, secretary of states. That's where voting procedures should have been in the year 2000. That's where it should be today. But uh, judging from what I've read in the press recently, that may not be where it will be on Tuesday. And because of the centrality of mail-in voting, that makes the, the administrative uh, kind of effectiveness of the post office all the more essential. Ryan, uh, Richard just sort of outlined a couple of key things there. One, mail-in voting back to the Civil War and as a part of the sort of normal way we think about um, making sure that service men and service women can exercise the franchise. That's, that's part of it. And that trajectory is an important one historically. And then the second one, mm -hmm about some states beginning to adopt. So let's pick that part up, um, mail-in voting, or if either one of you want to talk more about that. I don't know, Ryan, do you want to say a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing to underline here is that mail-in voting is was deeply uncontroversial. 
right? It's been a common practice for many communities and many states for a very long period of time. It's not that administratively complex for the Postal Service to handle this. Yeah. What is new is, as was mentioned, the is the elephant in the room, right? The politicization of it and the attacks against it, which have added anxiety, that's new. And the more recent ruling that we just had a few days ago that questions this notion of when will you stop counting the ballots is deeply alarming. Like I, I'm not a professor of law, I'm not a practicer of law, but to read that opinion and to consider this notion that somehow the counting of ballots itself is disruptive to the election, just echoing here what Richard said, is so worrisome. It's the counting of the ballots that is the election. It's not something that tips the election, right? It's to emphasize Richard's point here. And so this is how we start to see something that starts at the top with Trump, where something uncontroversial is then made controversial, but then we also see enabling institutions that are also critically important because they either do not push back, which is incredibly worrisome, or they legitimize these unfounded fears, right? The legitimation of if we count the ballots, it's somehow going to invalidate the election or thwart the intent of the electorate. This is simply not the case. And you see how what looks like a fantastical set of worries all of a sudden start to seep in and become part of these other institutions that quite honestly ought to know better and ought to push back. I just want to stay with this for a second because uh, maybe my mind has been so poisoned by the partisanship of our time. I'm trying to reconstruct in my mind a time when there wasn't an argument against expanding voting, um, <clears throat> restrictions on motor voter laws, um, pushing back on the idea of giving even time off from work. I mean, this has been a lively point of political debate in quite not just recent memory, but it's pretty far back in my mind, but you're both sketching out for me a time in which expansion of mail-in voting was somehow uncontroversial. So there's a threshold point that was crossed there at some point when it became conventional wisdom that if more people vote, it's bad for whom? I'm assuming the argument here is it's bad for Republicans, although I'm not sure there's data to bear that out, but when did that become somehow political conventional wisdom? Well, that's a good question. Um, certainly, President Trump has said publicly that if everyone votes who can vote, that the Republicans will never win another election. That's an extraordinary claim. I don't know of a yeah. public figure to have made such a statement, to say the quiet part out loud. And, and that's been said in the 2020 election cycle. Look, both Democrats and Republicans have engaged in all kinds of uh, voter suppression tactics going back to the 19th century. So it's not as if we are, have some pristine past, but the specific issue here is attacking the mechanism by right. which the votes are right. being delivered. Now, you could, you could argue that it is disadvantageous and therefore should be discouraged to mail citizens ballots. That is to say, to mail anyone a ballot, not simply those citizens who have requested a ballot. And that is more or less within the range of the kind of debate we've had in the past about making it easier or harder to vote. And certainly the Democrats in the 19th century worked very hard to make in the South to make it hard for African Americans to vote, right? But the idea that once the ballot is in the mail, that it's not going to be delivered in an expeditious way, or that, you know, they might be destroyed, or there might be some kind of, that's always been illegitimate. Um, and the scale on which it could be practiced today, because of the, uh, because of the rhetoric that's coming from the top, makes it a concern. And hats off to Elizabeth Warren, Massachusetts Senator, who has been on top of this issue, almost on a daily basis, calling most recently for Detroit's resignation, which is what a senator will do in this place, but just to keep kind of his feet in the fire, that this is an issue that there should be congressional oversight of. So I don't mean to imply that everything's been hunky-dory before yeah, the no, I see. election. The issue yeah. in 2000 was the recount. The ballots were in, it was the right. recount. Now we're talking about actually, <laughs> actually counting ballots that have arrived and that may well not have gotten where they should have gotten 
because of some sort of administrative foul up in the post office. That's where the current debate is now, as I see it. Ryan, I first of all, just your reaction to that, and that also this is you've both helped me see yet one more f flashpoint for federalism throughout this pandemic, which is that it's states which will decide whether or not the vote by voting by mail is allowed and how they will make those ballots available. And there's a whole spectrum of how that occurs and when those can be received. But ultimately it's a federal responsibility to make sure that those ballots get where they need to be by a certain time. So here we have yet another clash that in the, and I've lost count of how many there are um, in which we find states and the federal government feuding over the responsibilities of government in the middle of this pandemic. Ryan, do you want to, come in on any of that or it just it really drives and pulls like you know clearly into focus here why people were so worried rightly over the summer about these administrative changes yeah. or even if it wasn't they weren't worried about the changes the presumption and the identification of these slowdowns right because it's that interconnection between states setting particular rules about when the count when when ballots you know late so-called late arriving ballots would or would not be accepted and how it plays into sort of administrative details of postal service. Now, as someone who studies the post office, I'm thrilled that people care about sorting machines all of a sudden. This is, this is, you know, finally, I have someone that I can talk to about this and they don't look at me like I've lost my, you know, lost my senses. We're here for you, Ryan. Thank, thanks, but it's deeply troubling, the idea here that we're gonna see administrative changes and then are gonna feed into the denial of the vote. It's, it's so yeah. alarming, it's so worrisome. And so, you know, where we go from here is an open question after the election, of course, so much hinges on it. But we, um, it's my sincere hope that these so-called late arriving ballots don't play a significant role in what's to come in the next coming days, but I fear it may. Let, yeah, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, point. Um, this, is, this is building on something that the journalist David Dayan wrote recently, and it's an obvious point for a historian. Bush v. Gore in 2000 was a travesty of justice because the founders or anyone who had a smidgen of respect for originalism as a judicial philosophy would not have given the Supreme Court the authority to settle an American presidential election. Now, there are three justices on the Supreme Court named Kavanaugh, Roberts, and Barrett who all claimed to be originalists. They all were part of that team in Florida that was holding up the recount. Now, they were not on the Supreme Court at that time. They now are on the Supreme Court. Scalia thought that opinion was outrageous in Bush v. Gore. Any originalist would think it was outrageous for the Supreme Court, nine unelected men and women, to settle an election. It's up to the states, and states have their own procedures and different states, uh, in Pennsylvania in particular, I don't believe you're allowed to count the ballots until the day of the election. So in those states, we have to respect our founders' commitment to federalism. We have to respect originalism. And if the Supreme Court deigns to intervene, I think not only is it outrageous, as it was in 2000, but I should think that if the Congress is so inclined, they might want to consider impeachment because that is completely out of keeping with the mandate of a Supreme Court that is committed to judicial restraint. And I think that needs to be underscored. The journalist David Dyan made the point very well, and that needs to be underscored and highlighted. And the Supreme Court needs to hear that from as many places as possible in the days and weeks to come. Ryan, I you can you hear me clapping through my basement in Waltham, Massachusetts. I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's hard to see how the court survives with any legitimacy. I mean, after what's happened in the last few weeks, it's already a question, I think. But thinking about the role for they may play in reversing or overseeing state procedures when it comes to balance, it's already happening, right? We're in the middle of this now. It's not something that's going to happen. It's happening today. Thinking about how they survive with any degree of legitimacy is very that's much an open question. Let's slow it down for a second for because maybe not there's so much news happening right now. Maybe not everybody's up on it. Ryan, I'll bring you in on this first and then Richard. So we've been talking about it, Kavanaugh, certainly, um, who wrote a separate opinion a couple of days ago in this Wisconsin voting 
um, case, but there's also a Pennsylvania uh, issue that was already brought before the court. Can you, I'd like to just hear from both of you a little bit more detail about what's happening with the court right now, what's at stake. You, you've sort of sketched out the longer term picture, what happens if they get too involved, but what are actually the issues before the court specifically? Ryan, you first. My understanding, and I'll leave it to you, Scott and Richard to correct me when I get it wrong, which I'm sure I will, is that Robert's opinion is already having a significant effect in the Fifth Circuit, I think it's the Fifth Circuit, where essentially they're going to, it looks like, try to shut down late or so-called late arriving ballots. Um, the question in Pennsylvania was people were, some some people were worried that with the addition of the new justice onto the court, they were going to revisit and essentially overturn their earlier ruling around um, the time frame for ballots arriving to be counted in Pennsylvania. They did not do that. The new justice did not take part. However, that issue can and likely will be revisited. So they're going to essentially separate out ballots that arrive after a certain period of time. And the question then will become, does the court have the gall or the nerve, however you want to describe it, to step in and essentially invalidate these ballots that already have arrived or already in the possession uh, of the authorities, but are going to essentially intervene to, as I would see it, essentially block the will of the state legislator, uh, or the state government. So those are the issues that we're looking at now. And what made Kavanaugh's opinion so troubling was that it was bringing back things from Bush v. Gore that at the time were intended, if you could sort of believe it or stomach it, never to be repeated, right? These are things that weren't going to be precedent, but of course they are. And they're being exhumed and brought back in ways that right. for those of us who have good memories, I was a college student then, and I'm sure we both certainly remembered as well. Uh, it, it brings back some very nasty echoes. We need to go back to 1876 and ask ourselves, how did we settle a disputed election in 1876? We did not rely on nine unelected justices to, uh, to, just, to to pick the president. That was not what we did. And certainly at this moment in time, when we have justices who claim to be originalists, more than anyone else, they should be aware of that. So I do think, I would hope Elizabeth Warren will keep on this issue and that we will have some uh, serious repercussions uh, following the election, should the Supreme Court be so arrogant as to take it upon itself once again to settle a U.S. election potentially over the will of the American people? I'm going to put I'll put Richard on the spot and see if I'm, I'm guessing he's going to know this answer. But am I wrong to think that the compromise of 1876 involved the postmaster general in some way? Wasn't it part of the the essential settling of the disputed election? Did it involve the postmaster general, the the designation of a new postmaster general, or okay. am I now? A Confederate postmaster, an ex-Confederate postmaster general was appointed. Uh, the real issue was the, the, the troops in the South that uh, Grant had worked very hard to break the Ku Klux Klan, which he had done, a huge achievement, uh, to ensure voting rights for African Americans and basic civil rights. And, and that was an issue that was contested. All the votes went to the Republican candidate, Hayes, and the troops uh, were removed from the yes, South. So I think, I think it was a, might have been a Tennessee postmaster general, but that was not that was not the centerpiece of it. Um, the, the the more important the news from the South was being all filtered through the New York Associated Press with Democratic stringers, and so those Democratic stringers were not reporting on the achievements of black churches, of mm. black elected public officials, of you know black uh, achievements. In, in, in farming, agriculture, commerce. Had that been the case, uh, then you might have had a different public opinion. But the public opinion was very much distorted by the tight control of Democratic stringers over the New York Associated Press. And of course, the New York Associated Press was not willing to uh, challenge that. So there's a, you know, I'm not suggesting that it's a simply a South North issue, but there was a reversal of policy, courageous policy of uh, President Grant. I'd love a conversation that goes easily from 2020 to 1876 to 1790 and back. I, I just want to follow up on one thing because, so let's just play out this scenario for a second. The, the law in Wisconsin or Pennsylvania or, or any state um, that receives mail-in ballots will stipulate um, when those ballots have to be in. Mm -hmm. And Kavanaugh's ruling, as I understand it, says, yeah, so ones that come in after that, we're going to hold them 
aside, if that comes to pass, mm. won't there have to be some analysis of the reason for the slowdown? I mean, that seems to me just the sort of glaring thing we've been talking about this whole hour, which is that there's an obvious documentable slowdown of mail delivery rates. How can that not come to bear on the judicial decision? That's a good question. <laughs> I, I feel sometimes I ask these questions, I'm like, am I I'm losing my mind, I think. I mean, um, Scott, though, it's the same thing when we see, like, it's in some way, an ignoring of the reality of the pandemic to make accommodations, right? These decisions, sometimes they bracket off the real world. And in this case, I think this would be one of those bracketing offs, right? Ignoring the material reality of why some of the ballots are arriving when they are in order to arrive at a decision that on its face, if you, you know, or if you step back for a moment, it looks perplexing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there are other imponderables here. I mean, there is an assumption that the late votes are going to be Democratic votes. Right. We don't know that. Don't know that. Um, we don't know. Uh, there, and we don't know how one state uh, secretary of state would decision as opposed to another state secretary of state. We don't know what the popular mood is going to be on election night and the days after that, the people in the streets um, are, uh, are, are, uh, are a variable. So there's a lot of things we don't know, but it's hard. There are very few moments in American history when you look at the post office and you say, ah, something the post office did or didn't do was decisive. And that's kind of a frustration writing about the post office. The abolitionist males controversy is probably the closest we've come to an incident that really had immediate consequences with long-term effects. And some say Lincoln's election and the possibility that abolitionist postmasters would be appointed in the South really tipped Southern states to seceding. But it could well be that we are in a, a moment when historians will look back and want to scrutinize what was going on in those voting centers and what was going on uh, behind the scenes uh, with these decisions that are not being made public, which in and of itself is, is a travesty. It's a public institution. The decision should be public, made accessible. Um, and, and we may then be in a situation where DeJoy will go down as one of you know, like the Harding administrators is yeah. one of the real buffoons and villains yeah, yeah, yeah. in American history. That seems to be the that seems to be the future that he is carving out for himself to be vilified. Um, postmaster generals don't generally get into the history books, um, but he is he, he's he's on his way to uh, such a uh, such a place if the organization does not come through and then ultimately if the court uh, forces the issue which I hope I hope it will not um yeah. 2000 was a big mistake um that's widely recognized especially widely recognized by conservative jurists uh and we shouldn't repeat that mistake again we only yeah. have one dread scott let's put it that way right so um let's uh let's take that as some consolation we're almost up on time. Just reminding everybody that you're listening to COVID calls. We have one last quick question in, get both guests to, to give me their sense of it. Um, without necessarily predicting outcomes for both possibilities uh, for next week, um, I would like to know what you think reforms are going to come one way or the other mm. um, for the Postal Service. Because, I mean, obviously Congress is going to scrutinize this no matter what happens next week. I'm sure we're going to have hearings and investigations. Ryan, let me start with you, and then uh, Richard, last word for you. One thing, thinking about scrutinizing the recent decisions by the Postmaster General and others below him, uh, you know, one thing that troubled me so much in the OIG report was this idea of orders only be get, only being given orally, right? So this is something that always makes me alarmed and nervous um, because of the lack of a paper trail. But I think the big question about what's going to happen to the SPS after the election is, it's unknowable because it doesn't only rest on the outcome of the presidential election, it significantly rests on Congress as well. Um, the troubles that the post office has been having have been exacerbated by Trump and Trump's attack. It's been exacerbated certainly by the pandemic and the drop in mail volume and the complications there. 
But the lar larger story for the last 15 years or so has also been related to Congress settling it with a fairly onerous requirement around, you know, something as arcane as retirement benefits. Now, mm. reform needs to happen. And I hope when reform does happen that it recognizes the Postal Service as an important civic institution and treats it like one. But I fear, depending on the outcome of the election, that may not be the case. But I'm eager to hear what Richard thinks on this topic. Yeah, Richard. Yeah, just a couple of I mean, I agree with what you said, Ryan. A couple of points. And neither FedEx nor UPS want a responsibility for mail-in ballots. Uh, so we, we have an organization that has mm. assumed that responsibility uh, and should remain that responsibility. So that's just one observation. Second, um, there has been a well-funded kind of radical libertarian project to undermine the integrity of the Postal Service for some time. And there's evidence that uh, the appointment of DeJoy was part of this project. David C. Williams, who was on the Board of Governors, resigned. DeJoy was not even in the original pool of possible postmaster generals. Now, um, raises the question, will this libertarian project uh, gain traction as a result of the problems this summer? Or could it be derailed with the recognition that this organization is absolutely fundamental to the civic fabric. It's what the founders intended, that it is working well. It has 90% uh, approval, much from Pew, Pew, recent Pew public opinion survey, higher than any other branch of government. And therefore, we could expand its mandate. Postal banking, Elizabeth Warren's talked about. It could be the one-stop shopping for all kinds of government services, broadband through post offices. There's a lot of things it could do. And by far biggest network of any organization in the country reaching into lots and lots of small uh, towns and villages. Uh, and it's not a red and blue question. Uh, you've never had a, a, a partisan uh, a move to eliminate uh, the post office because it's so important in rural America. So it could lead by focusing attention on the organization. It might mm. just lead to a postal renaissance, which would be good for the country. And it would certainly be in keeping with the hopes and aspirations of our founders. Wouldn't that be something to come out of this pandemic, infodemic Strong. year, a postal mm -hmm. renaissance? I think it's a nice nice place to leave it. It's an incredible week of discussions on COVID calls. And next week, please join me. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, be having a pre-election episode, an election day episode, and a post-election episode. And I've scheduled the post-election episode in a moment of great hope for our country in which we might have something definitive to say, but might not in that one. But please join me next week for those and all the other COVID calls every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Ryan Ellis and Richard John, uh, just a great hour. Thanks very much for it. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Nice to see you, Richard. Thank you as well. Stay healthy, everyone. We'll see you on Monday, 5 o'clock.